Well, I am Mr. Petrus, for those of you who don't know me. It's good to see you this morning. Um, it was great to worship God through song, and we're going to worship him through his word right now. How's that sound? Good? All right. You guys are lively. I like it. So I'm going to ask you guys a question, first of all. If I were to ask you to define what it means to be blessed, what would you say? Who has a, a definition of what it means to be blessed? Yes. To be given good things, that's actually a really good definition. Anybody else? What does it mean to be blessed? Come on, I know you guys know. Go ahead. And it doesn't have to be a perfect answer. It's what you think it might mean to be blessed. Okay, to maybe have grace put upon you. Okay, that's a good answer. All right, right here. To be given something, okay, something special. Yeah, those are all really good definitions, but in the Bible, what it really means to be blessed is to have God's favor, to have God look favorably upon you. And so now that we've defined blessed, having God's favor, the question I want to answer for you guys today is, how can we be blessed? That's what I want to talk about today, how to be blessed. That's the title of my message today. So there's a word that I want you guys to learn today, one word, and if you can walk away with this one word, I think it's pretty easy, then we will be doing our job here. And the word I want you guys to write down, and you'll follow it along, is obey. Obey. So what does it mean to obey? So today we're going to learn how we can be and already are blessed by being obedient to God and his words. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4 in your Bibles. You guys know where that is? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Oh, you guys are great. So today we're starting a new book of the Bible. We are starting Deuteronomy. And so while you're turning there, I'm going to do a little bit of history lesson. Who likes history? I love it. I love history. So... We also are going to do a spelling lesson. Are there any spelling bee people out here? Anybody? There's a couple of them. Okay. Um, I've got two words for you to learn today. Not obey. We are going to walk away with that. And we're not having a test on this, but the word Pentateuch. Have you guys ever heard that word? Pentateuch. So that Pentateuch is what the Bible refers to as the first five books of the Bible or the law. So today we're starting Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book we've been going through all of this year in the Old Testament. So the fi first five books of the Bible were written to who? Who has an answer? Who, who were the first five books of the Bible written to? Yes, in the back. Moses wrote them. Who was he writing them to? Yes. To God's people, to Israel. So the first five books, the Pentateuch, were written to Israel. Why were they written? Anybody want to take a guess why Moses wrote these five books? Okay, to show that God had all power in the back. That's a really good reason. God did tell him to write them. But God wrote these five books so the people would remember who God was. And he also laid out his law in these books. So we're at the book. Are you guys at Deuteronomy? So Deuteronomy, it's a long word. So when I said that's a spelling bee, that's something for you to think about. Remember how to spell that as you grow up and continue through life. It's a long a word, but it's a good one to know how to spell. It means second law. Second law. So God had already given the law to the people. So he's not actually giving the law again. What he's doing is Moses is reminding the people of the commandments that have already been given to them. See, the people of Israel are on the edge of entering the promised land. They've been wandering around the desert for 40 years, 
and they were rescued out of Egypt. God delivered them by using Moses. And, and a, an entire generation has actually died off. So this is a brand new generation about to enter the promised land. And Moses is speaking to the people to remind them and tell them how it will go well for them, how they can be blessed when they enter the land. So chapters one through four are actually a speech that Moses is giving and just reminding them of all that God has done and all that will happen to them as they enter the land. So we're going to start at verse one of chapter four, and I'm going to read. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers is giving to you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I commanded you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all of these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Point number one, obey and be blessed. There's that word, right? Obey. The word I want you to take away from today. So. It says in verse 1, to listen to the commands and live. Don't add, don't take away. Obey is what that means. So he gives an example of these people who weren't obedient to God, who didn't trust God, and they perished. In fact, a whole generation has disobeyed God. They doubted God. They didn't want to follow the spies into the land. All of these things, and those folks... A whole generation is not going to enter the land. So does it mean that you've got to obey the Ten Commandments in order to be saved? I love the head shake. No, it does not. In fact, these, these commandments weren't used for salva salvation. They're actually in response to God saving them already. These, these people that had not... Uh, not entered the land, that are not going to enter the land, they were not obedient. And so the obedience is the response to God saving them. Their obedience identified them as God's people to all the nations around them. So disobedience proved that they were never God's people at all. So they didn't need to obey the Ten Commandments. God had already rescued them out of Egypt. So they were already rescued and saved. But those who didn't believe or didn't obey, they proved that they weren't rescued by God. So let me ask you this. Do Christians need to obey the Ten Commandments to be saved? No, absolutely not. You can't be saved by following the law. But Christians obey because they've been saved. So at home, what, do you, what are some things that you guys have to obey? Listen to your parents. A lot of hands went down. What else? What other rules? What about school? Go ahead. Yeah, what your parents say. That's really good to obey your parents and listen to them. Go ahead. Listen to your teachers. Yes, at school. One more. You have to obey to feed your snake. I don't know. I mean, that's something you should do if you own a snake. But um, I don't know that that's a command. But what happens when you guys obey your parents or obey your teachers? You don't get in trouble. Or the opposite of maybe you get some sort of blessing, right? Obedience is going to bring blessing. 
Now, your parents, they don't love you just because you obey, right? Right. They just, they love you anyway. But you get blessed when you obey. But when you disobey, do you get blessed? No. There's some sort of punishment or some sort of uh, thing that could happen to you if you don't obey. You're definitely not getting blessed for disobedience. And neither did the Israelites. Blessing comes from obedience. And that blessing is getting to be one of God's children. You know, it, it, it does mean, I mean, does this mean that everything will be perfect when you obey? When you obey your parents, is your life perfect all the time? Yeah. No. But God will work everything out for his good, for your good and his glory. In Romans 8, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to this purpose. So in general, when we obey, things are going to go good for us. We obey in faith, and faith in Jesus for the Christian, right? Believing in Jesus proves that we love God. And because we love him, we will want to obey. And then we get blessed from that. And not only us, but we bless others when we share the gospel with them. So Israel, this nation, God had them to go into the land to bless all the other people around them and point to God. So what we can do, we can bless others around them when we point to Jesus. So obey and be blessed. So the next thing Moses did was remind the people not to worship idols. What's an idol? Who, who can, go ahead. Okay, fake prophet, back corner. I, I, that's a really good, that's probably a, the best definition, a carved image. That's what the Bible describes as an idol. One more. A golden statue, and I think I have a picture of a golden statue up here. I might. There it is. Um, the Israelites, they had already worshipped this calf. This was long before uh, they were going to enter the land. This was when Moses got the Ten Commandments. And in the land they were about to go into, remember, they're on the edge, and they're getting ready to conquer the promised land. The people that were already there had plenty of idols. Point number two, obey by not turning to idols. So the people that were worshiping this golden calf and the Israelites, do you think they ever saw God? Do you think they ever saw God in person? No, they did not. But they did stand on the mountain and hear God's voice, and they saw this cloud of smoke. Back in our chapter um, 4, verse 11, it says, And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sounds of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. So they, these people had heard God's voice and knew he did exist. And he'd done all of these things. He parted the Red Sea. He had this pillar of fire and a cloud to follow them through the desert. He gave them manna out of heaven. All of these great things. But nobody ever saw God face to face. They knew he existed. In fact, Moses asked to see God's face. And what did he do? What did, God, did God show Moses his face? No, only the backside of him. And even then, Moses fell down and, and couldn't handle that. Exodus 33 says, but, but he said, you can, this is when Moses is, is asking to see God's face. God says, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So Moses couldn't even bear to see God's face. And we know nobody has ever seen God's face, but they can know he exists. So back in our passage in verse 15, it says this, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, 
Beware lest you ask, cor act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any fig figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven, but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be a people for his own inheritance as you are to this day. Remember that song we sang, Indescribable? You made the stars in the sky and you know them by name. So people actually worship the stars and worship the sun and worship the moon. God is telling his people here, do not do that. You can worship who made those. That's what we should do and be giving thanks, but not worshiping things. So why do you think that God is so strong about people worshiping idols? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Why do you think God doesn't want people to worship idols? Even a carved image that might, they might think is God. Go ahead. Well, it is sinning. Why do you think he, he's, he's against it, though? Right here. I think that is a, he said he doesn't want that because he's the highest. God doesn't want anything to even take the substitution of what might be him. He's so great that really you can't make something that, that, that looks like him. So it, it says here in our chapter that you're, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is jealous. He doesn't want anything to get in the way of people worshiping him and him alone. He's jealous for, for that worship. In fact, there was punishment that came along with worshiping idols. And what's so scary about this chapter, Moses actually predicts, and this, this will happen as you get later on through the Bible, he predicts that these people will fall away from God, and when they do enter the land, they will start worshiping idols. And there will be a consequence for it. Verse 25 says this, when, you're, when you father children and children's children and you have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord so as to provoke him for anger, to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there, will, and there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. God is predicting here through Moses exactly what will happen. The Israelites did get into the land. They did possess it. But they started to serve idols and other gods when they got into the land. And so God will punish those who continue to disobey him. So what kind of things do we have in our lives that could be idols? Yeah. Video games. Oh, video games. Video games could be an idol. Yes, right here. Your toys, right? Your favorite toys. Let's see, someone who hasn't answered yet. Pokemon, okay, that could be an idol. Oh, the TV. Does anybody like the TV over, over some things, right? Go ahead, last one. Money. Money is an idol. I, I don't know how much you guys idolize money these days, but as people get older, money can be a really big idol. So we have, sometimes we can put those things ahead of God. And we, and we need, and also things in nature. I mean, I love to go outdoors, and we learned, um, if you guys have been going to Adventure Club, you learned about um, special and general revelation, how, you know, there's things out there that, you know, God gave general revelation to people, but people don't worship him because of that. They worship the, the, the things that are created. So how do we avoid that? 
we need to just pay attention that we're not putting other things ahead of God. We can like things. We can like our toys and our video games and our Pokemon. But if it comes in the way of you worshiping God, then it could be becoming an idol. I mean, we don't need to make an image of God. We don't need to put these things. We have something that actually God reveals himself to. So we don't need a picture of him. We don't need to worship something. We have his word, right? We have the Bible. That's what he's given us to know him, to see him. And we can believe God and believe in God and that he creates and he does all these things because we have his word. And that's called faith. That's, we can believe by faith. We don't need to see God. And that's what he's calling us to do is believe by faith. That faith is the faith that saves people. But God is gracious as well. So he, he promised to keep his covenant with his people if they repent. So back in our chapter, in verse 29, it says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him, if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. He was going to, these people would come back to him even after they turned away. And, we, and Christians, when they fail and they do things, do they lose their salvation? Can a Christian lose their salvation? The answer is no, they cannot. If you're a true Christian, you cannot lose your salvation. You, but you can repent if you've done something or if you've you know, gone away and put something else in front of God and quickly receive God's forgiveness. That's where it's just, he's a merciful God. He's not going to forget his covenant with those that believe in the gospel. So we need to continue to live our lives that way. Obey by not turning to idols. And last, lastly, there's a third way we can obey. Obey because of his awesomeness. Point number three. So Moses is going to finish up his speech by reminding the people what God has already done from the beginning for them. It says in verse 32, Or ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to another whether such a great thing has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of fire as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt? So God is reminding these people what he has done for them through Moses that he's brought them out of the land, that he's done all of these great things. He gave them water and he gave them manna to eat. And when they wanted meat, he gave them birds. God has chosen to show his people mercy all along so he can display his glory throughout earth. Their obedience proved that they trusted God. He did all of these awesome deeds. And their obedience guaranteed that it would go well with them. So Moses is reminding these people of all the awesome deeds that God had done. Is God still awesome today? And the mo he, you're absolutely right. He is awesome today. But the most awesome thing that he did was give us Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. All of these things that we're learning about through the Pentateuch, these first five books of the Bible, are all just a foreshadowing of what God would do delivering people from their sin through Jesus. God delivered Israel. God delivers his people through Christ. And his forgiveness is just as close as turning from our sin and trusting in Jesus. If you do this, it will go well with you. You will be blessed. That's the promise of the Bible. 1 Thessalonians uh, 1, 9 and 10 said this, For they themselves report concerning the kind of reception we had among you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait 
for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This verse explains these people in Thessalonica were following idols. They turned from those idols. They turned to God. That's the blessing is, is they turned to Jesus. And this is how awesome God is. It's great news and it's easy. And if this is you, if you've already turned from your sin and followed Christ, you already are truly blessed. But if you haven't turned yet, I'd have to ask you, why not? What's holding you back? What idols or what things in your life are keeping you from following Jesus all the way? That's the real question. If you want to know how to be blessed, the simple answer is following Jesus. And if you, if you haven't done that and you have questions about this, ask someone. Ask your parents. Ask your leader today. Ask me if you catch me in the hallway or something. I'd love to tell you that's how, that's how you're blessed is by following Jesus. But all of these things we learned today, what is the one word, the one word that I wanted you to learn today? You can all say it. Obey. 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 Obedience is not because we earn our way to God. Obedience is how we're blessed. And we're blessed by obeying God's, God's laws by not turning to idols, and by seeing how awesome God is. So that's all I have for you today, guys. Let me pray, and then you guys can talk about what we, what we learned. God, we want to come before you today, Lord, and see your awesomeness. Lord, we see that you are a God who blesses his people. You are merciful and forgiving. Lord, we pray that we are those who turn to you, Lord, and repent of our sin. Lord, I pray that if there are those who have never done that, Lord, that they would even do that today, that they would see their need, that they would see if there are idols in their life, that they can turn to you instead of following those idols. So God, we give you this time for the rest of the day. Thank you for uh, showing us things out of your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen.